Well, let me extend my greetings to all of you this afternoon and say thank you for being here at Southeastern Seminary for this very momentous occasion. One of the great blessings of mine is to not only get to work with students like these who are graduating today and then going out to serve our Lord wherever it is that he sends them, I also get to work with an incredible faculty. I'm convinced it's the best faculty anywhere on the planet, and it has been my joy now almost 20 years to work with these men and women. But there is one sad note that arises, and that is some of them reach a point where there is a transition in their career and their service to the Lord, and they move into what is known as retirement. Retirement not from serving the Lord, but retirement from teaching full-time here at Southeastern. And I believe that convocation, excuse me, graduation is a great time and appropriate time to recognize them. And so there are several that are with us this afternoon, and so I want to just bring them to your attention and ask them to stand when I call their name. Dr. David Beck, who teaches New Testament and Greek here. Dr. Al James, who teaches missions. Dr. John Hammett, who teaches theology. And Dr. Sam Williams, who teaches counseling. Gifts from the Lord to this wonderful school. And would you join me in just saying thank you for their service here all these many years. I didn't bring it up in the early service, but I guess I'm in a more playful mood. I won't bring up the fact that uh, Dr. James, like I, is a over-the-top Georgia Bulldog fan, and Dr. Beck is an Ohio State fan. Now, if you know anything at all about football, then you know what happened last year in the semifinal of the national championship, but it would be inappropriate for me to bring that up, so. This morning, uh, and this afternoon, I felt led of the Lord to go to a passage for our uh, address today that I've never preached from before, and uh, some might even think it is a strange text for a graduation. At the same time, when I consider the graduates that I have the responsibility of giving a charge, and then when I consider the wide diversity of the audience that has come because they love one of these graduates and they're here to celebrate their graduation, I could not escape the fact that I believe the Lord was leading me to a passage of scripture. It is one of the most well-known passages in all the Bible immediately when I uh, share with you what I will be talking about and from what text, uh, your mind will go to the story. Uh, it is the story often known as the thief on the cross, but actually it is more accurately entitled the thieves on the cross or maybe even better than that, the man on the middle cross. And my goal this afternoon is to simply present to you, the man on the middle cross said, all of us can come. And the man on the middle cross said, all of you must go. And hear the word of the Lord beginning in Luke chapter 23 and verse 32. But we'll give attention in our address to one verse the last verse that I will read, verse 43. Luke 23, verse 32. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with Jesus. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments, and the people stood by watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself. He is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the criminals who was hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other thief rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for 
We are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man, he has done nothing wrong. And he said to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And here's our verse for the afternoon. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. This particular story was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12, 700 years before the event would take place. And I believe one of the reasons this particular story is so well known and so popular because it is a story of pure, undiluted grace. Furthermore, if you think about it, every one of us in this room is in this story. So what do you mean by that? All of us in this room can identify with one of the two thieves, either the thief who reviled and rejected Jesus or the thief who repented and believed and said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And so what I want to do is just quickly walk through this verse and make five different observations about the man who on the middle cross said, you can come. And the man who on the middle cross said, we must go. Number one, eternal life is something for you. Eternal life is something for you. And Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you. That word truly has the idea of a solemn oath. In other words, this is a word of certainty. Furthermore, Jesus addresses these words to the thief who has asked him, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. It is interesting when you look at this story and all the surrounding trappings of it, there are only two humble persons on the radar screen. One is the Lord Jesus. The other is the thief on the cross. And what Jesus is promising him is the gift of eternal life. Today you will be with me in paradise. And of course, the Bible speaks many times about the wonderful reality of eternal life and what it involves. In John chapter 8 and verse 32, the Lord Jesus said, You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. He said again in John chapter 10 and verse 10, I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Now, what I want all of us in this room to understand today is what Jesus promised the thief on the cross. He promises to every one of us in this chapel today. Eternal life is something for you. Number two, eternal life is something anyone can have today. It is something that you can have today. Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, today, today, today. In other words, yes, eternal life is something that lasts forever. There is a quantity to the understanding of eternal life. But at the same time, eternal life also has a qualitative nature to it. It's the very life of God, and it is something that you receive the very moment you repent and believe in Jesus. Yes, he was going to paradise because he had put his faith and trust in the Lord, but his eternal life actually began while he was still hanging on the cross. Yes, eternal life is something anyone can have today. Number three, eternal life, boiled down to its simplest understanding, is getting Jesus. Eternal life is just getting Jesus. Jesus said to him, today, now watch it, you will be with me. You see, the essence of eternal life is not living forever in heaven, though that is part of the deal. It's not even, I think, having your sins forgiven, though that likewise is part of what you get. But the very essence of eternal life is that you get Jesus immediately, now and forever. That's why the Apostle Paul could say, for me to live is what? Christ. And to die is gain. I just get more of Christ when I depart this life and go into the next. That is, again, the scandal of God's amazing grace. And furthermore, in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, the Lord Jesus made a wonderful promise to all who have received his gift of eternal life. The promise, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. 
Graduates, never forget that wherever you go, he's already there. And when you arrive, he's waiting on you. And wherever he leads you, even if it is through the valley of the shadow of death, he will be with you every step of the way. Eternal life is getting Jesus. Number four, eternal life is also paradise forever. Jesus says today, you will be with me in paradise. Paradise is actually only mentioned three times in the Bible. It is mentioned here in Luke chapter 23 and verse 43. It's mentioned again in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 3. And it's mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7. It's actually a Persian word, and it had the idea of a, a beautiful walled garden. But in biblical literature and also literature about the Bible, uh, the idea of paradise took on the imagery of the Garden of Eden. And then it took on the imagery of the Garden of Eden restored. Because in Revelation chapter 21 and 22, we read there of a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. And there is indeed a beautiful, wonderful garden city awaiting all those who know the Lord Jesus as their personal Savior. When I teach systematic theology and I address the issue of eschatology, that is the study of the end times, I will always remind my students that salvation and eternity is getting Eden back and more because in the midst of the garden is the Lord Jesus Christ. It is indeed living forever. But number five, eternal life is a gift that we must share with everyone. It is a gift we must share with everyone. Yes, Jesus dies on the cross in Luke 23. But as Paul Harvey, who is now in heaven, used to say, you need to go on and read the rest of the story. Because in the rest of the story, in Luke chapter 24, we find an empty tomb. And we find a resurrected Lord. And we find the Lord Jesus walking with his disciples, instructing them more perfectly in the word of God. And we find the Lord Jesus giving us at the end Luke's version of the Great Commission, where he tells us to go to the nations with this good news that today you can be with Jesus and someday you can be with him in a place called paradise. One of my heroes when it comes to the Christian faith is a man named Carl F.H. Henry. Carl F.H. Henry was probably the most influential theologian among evangelicals in the 20th century. But amazingly, this over-the-top, brilliant theological mind also had the heart of an evangelist. And many times I've had people tell me that when he came to their church or when he met missionaries on the mission field, immediately he began to look for people that he could share the gospel with. And Carl Henry perhaps was driven by that passion to make this profound statement, the gospel. It is only good news if it gets there in time. Graduates of Southeastern Seminary, that's your job. That's your assignment. I don't know where God is sending you. I don't know what God is calling each of you specifically to do. But I know that his goal for your life and his calling upon your life is to get the good news to people in time. If anyone was at the end of hope, it had to be the thief on the cross. He was a criminal, convicted rightly, perhaps a murderer, perhaps an insurrectionist, whatever he had done. It had warranted capital punishment. And yet at the very end of his life, when he could not lift a finger to do one good work, he looked in faith to the only one who could save him, and he simply said, Lord Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Several years ago, I was directed to a YouTube video by a friend of mine, a wonderful preacher named uh, Alistair Begg. And Alistair Begg was speaking about the gospel and the fact that you can't earn your salvation. Uh, there's no works that can be brought to your appeal before God when you stand before him. And in fact, he said, you know, of all the stories in the Bible, I think it is the thief on the cross that answers that ultimate question of life when you stand before God and he asks you, why should I let you into my heaven? What are you going to say? 
what are you going to say? And then he paints a picture that I cannot replicate, but he basically says, imagine for a moment when the thief on the cross stood at the gates of heaven. It's easy to imagine the angel walking out, asking him, what are you doing here? I saw the life you lived. I saw how you died. What are you doing here? The thief on the cross perhaps replied, I don't know. I'm surprised as much as you are. And the angel said, you know, I I need some help. I, I need to go find an archangel. Maybe he can help us figure this thing out. And so one of the archangels, perhaps even Michael the archangel, shows up and says, well, look, I I know how to handle this. Let's let me just raise and get you to ask, answer a few questions and and we can settle this whole thing. Uh, uh, Let me begin, first of all. I'm sure you have your doctrine of the Bible down. You you, you understand that this is indeed the inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word of God, don't you? And the thief probably said, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. So then he said, well, okay, let's let's, let's get more to the the really additional big things. Let's talk about the doctrine of justification. I'm sure that you have thought carefully and well, and you understand, I mean, you're here at the pearly gates, and you understand the, the doctrine of justification. He says, actually, no, I don't. How about the doctrine of the church? I ain't even heard there is a church. Holy Spirit? No. The end times. Everybody that's going to enter into heaven's got their end time theology down. And he said, nah, I'm afraid I'm proved deficient there too. And so by now, the angel has to be thinking he doesn't belong here. And so he says, well then, sir, why are you here? And the thief on the cross simply says, the man hanging on the middle cross said I could come. And the angel says, well, then come on in. You belong. I don't know who you are here today. I I don't know who you are in this large congregation. What I do know is that yesterday, these students that you're here to honor prayed for a good number of you because their heart is broken. Oh, they're thrilled that you're here for their graduation, but their heart is broken because you don't know the Savior that they know. But here's the good news of the gospel. The man on the middle cross says you can come. And he says you can come today. All you have to do is ask him. I want us to bow our heads for just a moment and close our eyes. Because what I want to do is give you the opportunity to do what the thief on the cross did. Just simply say, Lord, remember me. Remember me. Remember me in your kingdom. And how is it that 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 happens? It happens very simply by you repenting of your sins and putting your trust and your faith in Jesus and Jesus alone. For many, many decades, Billy Graham, every time he preached, would end his message by extending what is known as a sinner's prayer. The words are not magical. They're not. But this much I do know. If you will pray these words with me and mean them from your heart, you will be saved. Because the Bible says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord, the Lord Jesus, they will be saved. And so if you're here today, and you've never made that most important of all decisions to trust Jesus as your Savior, I'm going to voice a prayer out loud. I encourage you, I I plead with you, pray this prayer in your heart. The God in heaven will hear your prayer. He will answer your prayer, and he will save you. So just pray this with me, dear Lord Jesus. I thank you that you love me. And that you proved it by dying for me on that middle cross. I thank you that in your death, you paid for all of my sins. And I know that that is true. Because you were raised from the dead in victory. 
I acknowledge today I need a Savior. And I turn from my sins. I put my faith and trust in you and you alone. Save me, Lord Jesus. Save me. I'm counting only on you. And Lord Jesus, I do thank you that anyone praying that prayer, you have heard, you have answered, and you have saved. And Lord, we rejoice if even one soul this afternoon has now entered into a relationship with you. And today, someday, they will be with you forever in paradise. And Lord, when we are through with our graduation ceremony in just a short time and we're gathered in the courtyard celebrating, might it be that after they've given a hug on the neck and told these graduates how proud they are of them, that they might also simply say, by the way, when Danny prayed that prayer, I prayed it with him. And I know that Jesus has saved me because I asked him to. And I do know this, he always keeps his word. How we will rejoice, not only in their graduation, but in your salvation. And Lord, we thank you that you are a good, great, wonderful Savior whose arms are always extended wide open to receive anyone who will simply turn to you in faith. How we thank you for that gospel and how we accept the responsibility to take it to the very ends of the earth that all may hear that they may come. And Lord, we ask this and we pray this in your saving name. Amen and amen.